So Wisconsin used to be one of the Democratic states. What happened in Wisconsin in 2016? Some Midwest progressives are still trying to figure that out. Hill.TV's Crystal Ball sat down with author Dan Kaufman to talk about liberals' quest to reclaim Wisconsin's progressive legacy. My next guest believes it may have been the divide and conquer strategy of Governor Scott Walker that by attrition led to the wearing away of formerly vigorous progressive politics in that state. His book, The Fall of Wisconsin, The Conservative Conquest of a Progression Bastion and the Future of American Politics is author Dan Kaufman's examination of the history and the current status of politics in Wisconsin. And Dan joins me. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Um, so talk to me about the, the sort of genesis of the book because you're a native Wisconsin, Wisconsinite, that's what yep, you say, right? Yeah. Um, and you were very involved in reporting during some of the protest movements for Scott Walker. So talk to us about the, the trend and the progression that you've seen. Well, um, I was first alerted to this story by my mom, actually. I received an email at about 1.30 in the morning right after Scott Walker uh, had announced, shortly after he had announced, this measure called Act 10, which was the gutting of collective bargaining rights for pu public employees. And there were massive protests very immediately in Madison on the state capitol. And many hundreds of people from across the state, thousands, uh, came to testify in an effort to try to um, delay the bill, but also to speak out against it. Um, and I was really captivated by this uh, scene and the, this grassroots progressive protest against Act 10. Um, what wasn't known at the time was that uh, Governor Walker had confided to a billionaire donor that his strategy to change Wisconsin in a long-term way was to use what he called divide and conquer. This was captured by a documentary filmmaker and the woman had asked, her name is Diane Hendricks, she's a, a billionaire um, owner of a building supply company. She asked him, how can we get to be a completely red state, a, a right to work state? And he, he said, well, have you seen what we're gonna do with the public employees uh, because you use divide and conquer? And so explain what that means, is divide and conquer sort of pulling the labor movement apart? Exactly. One thing that he was, uh, Governor Walker received some endorsements from, well, one endorsement in particular from one of the big building trades unions, hmm. Local 139. He had promised them that he wouldn't introduce right to work. And a lot of um, people in the building trades tend to be, some, a significant proportion, tend to be conservative. They vote Republican, and he promised that he would remake Wisconsin's roads and provide a lot of jobs for the road builders. But there was some, um, he, in his inaugural address in 2011, he really stoked resentment against public employees, not just amongst labor, but against, amongst a lot of rural people who maybe don't have health insurance. And he said uh, that, you know, the thing that we need to do is the public employees can no longer be the haves and the taxpayers the have-nots. Mm. And so, so you sort of argue, number one, that it was no accident that unions were attacked so directly in this right. place that was a bastion of the labor movement. And number two, that that really laid the groundwork for Donald Trump winning Wisconsin in 2016. Absolutely. I think there's, there's new studies that show the impact of things like right to work on the Democratic Party's fortune. It's a very um, extreme um, weakening, both financially, but unions are also a place for workers to share ideas about policy and to coordinate. Um, it's really the only counterweight to the infrastructure on the right, which is very powerful in Wisconsin. A lot of uh, national conservative organizations were using Wisconsin as a kind of laboratory for um, policies that would be replicated in other states. And so then when the Clinton came, campaign came in, they sort of assumed Wisconsin always goes blue, so it's just going to go blue again. So what was their approach? Well, as you say, they came in, but they didn't really come in. <laughs> that was um, the problem. They didn't uh, come in. <laughs> Hillary Clinton never, uh, it's quite well known, she never campaigned during the general election. In, um, in Wisconsin, which was a shock to many people. And is that really the problem, or does that speak to a broader sort of misunderstanding of what was going on in the I ground I think there? it's not truly the problem, but it's emblematic of the abandonment of the National Democratic Party for things like the labor movement. The real core, the grassroots, the rank and file people, the foot soldiers um, in elections, 
uh, they have been abandoned. It wasn't just Hillary Clinton. Mm. During the um, recall election against Scott Walker in 2012, uh, President Barack Obama did not come to Wisconsin to show any kind of support for the protesters or the Democratic candidate. Well, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. And, you know, I, I've argued that the Democratic Party left behind the working class and the labor movement and really sort of intentionally realigned with this professional managerial class. I get a lot of pushback from people who say, no, Democrats have always been the party that stands with the working class. I mean, how do you respond to that criticism? What do you point to I think, as the Democrats moving away from that? Well, there's people like, uh, there's one person that's prominent in my book, uh, a very charismatic character named Randy Bryce, a union iron worker who has uh, staged a remarkable campaign against first Speaker of the House, Paul Ryan, who has since announced he's retiring. I think partly um, because Randy's uh, campaign caught such fire. Um, and what Randy did was reactivate this uh, progressive grassroots energy. I tend to agree with your view. I think at one time the Democratic Party was much more aligned with working class interests. But since, particularly since the 90s, the Bill Clinton era, mm -hmm. it's really shifted away. The donors and the funding has moved more towards professional managerial class. And that was shown in Wisconsin. They didn't really do that much, if anything, to help. And these were teachers, um, corrections officers. I mean, really just the bedrock uh, citizens that form the bulk of mm. their voters. And the Democratic Party had lost credibility with them. Now, full disclosure, yeah. as we talked about, I run an organization, People's House Project, that has endorsed Randy Bryce. Ah. But I know you wrote in the New York Times that you really felt that Bryce had some of the answers for the Democratic Party to try to reconnect with this working class base. What is it about Randy that makes him special? Well, I think he's tapped into something that is also similar to like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Something that's very, like, um, one thing that's been missing is I don't think the founders intended that Congress should just be populated by professionals, lawyers. And Randy is a real person, just like Alexandria. And there's a, a slew of candidates like this emerging across the country. And I think people, that's really refreshing to people. Also, his clarity, particularly on labor issues, given what's happened mm. uh, in Wisconsin, is really moving to people. People were really cognizant of Hillary Clinton's positions on free trade. And they, there was a sense that, um, you know, perhaps she'd be better than Trump, but it was difficult to, to muster much enthusiasm. Without this kind of enthusiasm that you saw, also in the Bernie Sanders campaign, particularly in Wisconsin, it really resonated. People forget he defeated Hillary Clinton by 13 points mm -hmm. in Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. um, this kind of energy, I think, is the only thing that can serve as a counterweight to a very powerful, well-funded conservative infrastructure. All right. Well, at least a little glimmer of hope there. We're moving <laughs> in a different direction. Dan Kaufman, the book is fascinating. Thank you so much for being Thank here. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. It. Thanks Absolutely. a lot. Yeah, a lot of lefties over in Wisconsin. <laughs> yeah. People forget that actually really the birthplace of American progressivism in a lot of ways. And then Scott Walker came along and things changed quite a bit. Remember they had the sit-ins in the state capitol, by the way? They did have sit-ins. pretty wild. Uh, you know, Wisconsin, all the way back to the, I guess, the farmer progressive labor party or whatever it was, been around for a long time. Democrats are wrestling over what to do in states like Wisconsin because you have a state that votes for presidents normally, but then has been voting for a Republican governor. Michigan was the same way. Donald Trump won both of those states. It's something that Democrats want to win the White House. Can't let it happen again. We'll have to see what goes on there. But next on Rising, we continue our, uh, our block on cheese with my sit-down interview with, <laughs> I, I get what they did, I like it, with Senate candidate Kevin Nicholson of Wisconsin. <laughs> More cheese. And later, from the Hill, we're joined by Alex Bolton and Reed Wilson, two of my favorites. We'll talk about what's on the pages of the Hill when Rising continues. Indeed.